I'm Janine Castella Lynn from the Berkeley Historical Society. And today is September 15th, 2021. And uh, we're very fortunate to have with us today, Lonnie Hancock, um, longtime Berkeley and California politician, um, member of the city council in Berkeley, Berkeley mayor, two-term Berkeley mayor, and um, assemblywoman and state senator for several terms each. So yeah, very illustrious career. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, and as is traditional, I think we'll start back at the beginning um, with your birth uh, before we go on to the 60s. Um, you, you were not born in California, is that correct? No, I was, I was born in Chicago. Uh, grew up in New York City. Uh, and both my parents were Unitarian ministers who were quite politically involved and very interested in social issues. So coming to Berkeley was in many ways an extension of the life that I'd lived up till then. So, okay, now we can fast forward to the 60s. Um, thank you. you. So you arrived in Berkeley in... 1964. Okay. I, I arrived in Berkeley a week before the recall election against the Berkeley School Board failed. And as you may remember, Berkeley was one of the very first uh, school districts in the country to voluntarily integrate its schools through busing. And there had been a recall uh, petition that qualified against the school board and that recall failed. And I remember very well listening on KPFA as the election returns came in and Carol Sibley and the other school board members were retained and thinking, what a great community. I'm going to love it here. And I did. Great. So um, was that in the spring, that the spring of 1964? No, I believe it was in the, the summer because I arrived here in the summer. And then in the fall was when I got involved with the, uh, the peace movement that started, of course, with the Vietnam Day Committee and the peace marches. Yeah, so that would have been the, the, the fall of the, the infamous free speech movement, right? 1964, Mario Savio and uh, throwing yourself on the wheels of the instant, <laughs> what is it exactly? But um, so were you, were you there at that, at that moment? Did you hear Savio's speech? I had, again, KPFA at the time, told you minute by minute what was going on in Berkeley. And I had taken my two young daughters in their stroller down to see the demonstration on Sproul Plaza and heard Mario's speech and then realized that my recollection, which I have not read in any history book, um, was that looking around, I saw a lot of policemen with guns. And that was the first time I'd ever seen that. And I thought, this, is not, this isn't a place to have little children. So I went home. So the next time I participated in anything was actually the Vietnam Day Committee um, march that left the campus and was then turned back at the Oakland border by armed Oakland police officers in riot gear. Again, one of the things that I think it's hard to realize if you weren't there is how shocking that was for a white middle-class American. And then of course, when uh, People's Park happened and James Rector was shot, um, all, it was a new world after that. As many people now say, it was a new world after 9-11. Uh, so, um did you get involved with a group of people who were reacting against police brutality or the university? Um, well, I was, my kids were in parent nursery school and 
we all talk politics while watching the kids. And one woman said to me, why don't you stop complaining about the war and go join Women for Peace? So I did. She gave me a newsletter. I did. And I worked with them on a number of things. They had, you know, we're trying to remove uh, Dow chemical products from supermarkets because of manufacturing napalm. And, and uh, they really did very good work. So I, I was involved with them, but some of the women in Women for Peace, like there was a woman named Charity Hirsch, her, her husband, Mo Hirsch, a math professor, was one of the organizers of the Vietnam Day Committee Peace March, um, as were towards a number of Cal professors who organized that. So yeah, there began to be a developing community, I think, of people who were very, very disturbed by the war, how it was going, what we were doing, why we were in there. There's so much that we look back on now with Afghanistan, that lessons we should have, could have, should have, would have learned, you know, but, um, and at that time there was a draft. So middle-class college boys were gonna get drafted and they were not gonna go there. And um, that was really, I think the campus community was the place from which uh, the peace movement came in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, in, it was in 1966 that, that Robert Shear um, ran for Congress to represent um, our district against the Democrat, Colin, Co how do you pronounce his name? Cohalen. Cohalen, uh-huh. Yeah, and what you need to realize is Jeffrey Cohalen was 100% AD, ADA liberal, as they used to say at the time. A very, he made the choice, which as we all know, the pressures on elected people, we understand now he made the choice to go with the majority of Democrats in Congress with the president, Lyndon Johnson, and support the war. And the Berkeley City Council unanimously voted to support the war. And that was when I think um, a group of really older people at the time in the peace movement, many of them associated with the university started trying to recruit a candidate to run against him. They wanted a peace candidate. And Bob Shear, who was only 30 years old at the time, a reporter for the LA Times, um, kind of said, okay, I'll go out there and try. And that was the obvious place for peace movement people to congregate and did, and he of course carried Berkeley by 54%, but not the rest of the district. So Cohalen was reelected. Uh -huh. But that galvanized um, and, and brought people together in, in Berkeley, his, it, his candidacy. It definitely, and, and that was when um, a group of us who'd worked on the campaign decided to stay together and we called ourselves the community for new politics and try to work on local issues. We had a slogan, you know, rebuild a corner of America, think globally, act locally. Um, and we worked on issues like parks and childcare, which was very controversial at the time. The city attorney said it was against the law for the city to fund childcare. I mean, it was it was a, an interesting time. Um, and we did that and then participated in a coalition that got broader every year and fielded slates of candidates. And eventually, of course, elected Ron Dellums who was also supported by the Berkeley Democratic Club. So he was supported by both groups of people. But, it, and it was interesting. Um, 
because he met with a group of us from the Community for New Politics after his election and showed us a map of where his votes came from. And it turned out he didn't win in the hills, which was the stronghold of the Democratic Club. He had won in the flats, which would have been the student area, a much larger black community at that time. And he and the progressive peace movement people. And he said, you know, you guys elected me and I agree with a lot of what you stand for and I'll work with you. And that was the first time anybody had ever said that. And of course we did and he did. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was a, so that's, yeah, that's very interesting history of how things went from, we just kind of went pretty quickly from 66 to 79 when, when Gus Newport was elected. Um, but that's that's sort of the, the end of the trajectory when when the city council, then the city council had a progressive majority because Ron Dellums voted with what was no, called no, no. The, Wait, what Ron I'm sorry, Ron no, Dellums. I'm sorry, Gus Newport, I misspoke. Gus Newport voted with the the progressive wing that came out of Shears candidacy and and all the the organization that came out of that. Yeah. Well, that position ran Gus. You remember those are the days when you'd have a thousand people in a school gym, passing a platform, and deciding on who the candidates would be, and Gus was chosen as a candidate um, at one of those conventions. So he was very clear, I think, about where his values were and who he was interested in working with. Interestingly, he and Gilda Feller turned out to be kind of buddies too, I think. And Susan Wengraff, you know, used to work for Gilda before she got on the council. So she knows a lot of this. She's a uh -huh. great story of history. Okay. So um, the group that came out of the Bob Shear you talked about as a community for the new left. So no, um, community for new politics. Okay, community. I should be taking notes instead of community for new politics. So in terms of its um, political avatar in Berkeley, did that become the April Coalition? Did the April Coalition come out of that? Um, in 1909, uh, there was a group called the Better Berkeley Council that um, had formed. There was the Community for New Politics, and there were the Associated Students at the University who were very active and wanted to be involved at that time. And uh, they fielded a slate. I think the April Coalition, and I think the April Coalition came later in 1971 when the students really massively got involved. At that time, it was the Better Berkeley Council, it, and it was the uh, Community for New Politics. And they nominated myself, me, and Charlie Sellers, who was a history professor at the time at Cal. And at that time, we went to the Berkeley Democratic Club's convention and said, you're gonna have a slate of four candidates. We think we're at least, um, at least half or at least a quarter of the local vote if you would put one of our candidates on your slate, we won't run anybody and we can all work together. And the Democratic Club said at the time, um, you people go win on your own votes, no. So, so this was 1969? Yep. Okay. And 
So at that point, Charlie Sellers said, well, I'm an old white guy and she's a young white woman. <laughs> she's a young woman and women are important. The women's movement was getting started. So he stepped back. So I was the only candidate out there. And, um, and then there was a young African-American candidate named Alan Wilson. And so we sort of paired up and campaigned together a lot. Um, and neither one of us got elected, but we got a lot of votes. We got more votes than any of the previous slates had ever had gotten. And so can I interrupt for a second? Was that Allison? Yeah. Allison Wilson? No, Alan Wilson. He Alice, was Alan man. Wilson. Okay, you're, you're, I'm, I apologize. I think okay. you're cutting out once in a while. That's why I'm having a little difficulty. Alan Wilson and you, and did you call yourself a different name than the the other group? Did you have a slate name? I can't remember. Uh, honestly, I I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So that was a time ago. <laughs> yes, of course. So, so that was sixty nine. You ran. You got a lot of votes. But the Democratic Club candidates prevailed. They they got more votes. That's right. right. Yeah. And, and what that taught us politically was that if you're going to have slate elections, at large elections, for slots, it doesn't really help to only run a short slate because everybody wants to use all their four votes. So even if they vote for you, they'll go vote for two of your opponents as well. And that will change things. So we learned, so then the next two years later, 1971, we ran four candidates and three out of the four were elected. And the one that lost, lost by 13 votes. Wow. Um, Rick Brown, later a very, very well-known and respected professor of public health at UCLA. He was a graduate student at the time. Rick got 13 fewer votes than Ed Colgren, who at the time was the only Republic, you know, Democratic club person who, that got elected. And that was when Tom McLaren said, we're not, we Republicans are not gonna run anymore in Berkeley. We're gonna support the more moderate Democrats. And after that, what you saw were slates um, being run by what you might call progressive new politics Democrats and more mainstream, but still liberal Democrats. And, um, it was a difficult time. It always kind of makes me think of cognitive dissonance, you know? The closer your ideas are together, the more fightly you will fear, <laughs> fiercely you will fight mm -hmm. over the differences that you have. And that did happen. Some people were able to cross lines and other people weren't, um, but you know, finally, it's, I think it's that part of it is uh, not happening anymore in Berkeley. Yeah. Okay. So um, who, in 71, uh, you ran, again, you mentioned with four people. Um, do you want to just mention the slate that you, who else uh, was on the slate? The slate, <clears throat> my Rick Brown and two quite relatively new uh, black community members, DeArmy Bailey and Ira Simmons. And um, what happened in that election was BCA, Berkeley Citizens Action, basically, uh, or the April Coalition, I guess it was then, said, the Black Caucus would choose two candidates and we would choose two candidates. And it was a very fraught situation 
because the army and I were, were pretty new in the community, although the army was on the poverty board. Um, and at the time I was on uh, one of the area councils on the war on poverty, the poverty board that Berkeley had. Um, so I remember him um, as a board member of that, but they were relatively new in town and they had seemed to have unlimited money and they were very brash. And kind of, I feel intimidated the Black Caucus. It was sort of like, we're gonna run anyway and we have all this money and we're, we agree with you on issues. So you endorse us or we're gonna run and you're gonna run and you'll all lose. And we had hoped actually to be running and the Black Caucus had hoped to be running Margot Deschiel. Um, but at the end of the day, they, it was the two of them together or nothing. And the Black Caucus made that decision. Um, and the rest is history. What can I tell you? Um, it, it was a, a extremely contentious time. Uh, the April coalition had a, a very long platform. I, I, I think you guys have a copy. I've given a copy to Bill Roberts. Um, and it had every idea you could think of from now what is totally mainstream to some ideas that still would raise eyebrows, but there it was. And again, the major issue at the end of the day was the war. And in that election, all three, the three of us got elected. Rick Brown, the student candidate, did not get elected. Um, and I always, because we knew him, he died a few years ago, but he was a very, very well-known uh, professor of public, uh, public health. And I always think California uh, and Rick were really lucky that he didn't get elected. <laughs> because he went on to make so many other contributions. Um, so the other candidates who are, did they call themselves the BDC? Did they say they were the, the, the Berkeley Democratic Club slate? I think, I think we'd have to go back and find some campaign material from that time. But oh yeah, they were certainly a slate. They were slate. And um, were they anti-war? No. They were for the war, and in 1971, the war wasn't over yet. Uh -huh. So, you know, I, I think they weren't, well, I don't know. I shouldn't speak for them. I, yeah, but your impression, your impression was that that was a dividing line, who was against the war and who was for the war. In, in terms of the city council. That was the genesis of the progressive challenge to mm -hmm. the traditionally liberal Democrats. I would say by that time, it may have started also um, morphing a little bit more into the economic justice issues. Because, you know, the original premise of the war dividend, bring it back, end poverty in this country, think of what we could do with it, um, was very strong. And especially because we had a very strong alliance with the Berkeley Black community. And they, as now, were suffering from discrimination, lack of economic opportunity and whatever. Um, and so that was very important. And, that opened up the door to issues like rent control um, and other issues. There were quality of life issues. Um, well, but those came up later. See, a lot of, before we had elected anybody, it was really the war and some of what were highly controversial issues around tenant protections and economic um, more economic equity. Mm -hmm. So 
um, you were elected in 71. Um, can I ask what were some of your first impressions of the, of the city council, the, the workings of the city council back then? Well, that was the most different period of my, my life or certainly my political life. Um, I had been part of a protest movement. All of a sudden, I was um, elected. I was trying to be effective. I felt like I needed to represent the people who had elected me. I firmly believed in most of the things that they stood for. And I did not get along well with the Army Bailey. Um, and he would do things like make a motion. And I wouldn't, if I didn't second it or if I opposed it, he would say things to me like, we're gonna run you and your honky friends out of town. Now you say that to a 30 year old inexperienced young woman and she gets worried. So that was a worry, but he made everybody's life miserable on the council. So I didn't meet with them or program with them. Then I had a bunch of issues to raise that um, that the moderates on the council who had five votes didn't want to vote for. And I kept trying to persuade them, but we were pretty mired in the kind of thing, almost like what you see in Washington now. If I proposed something, and especially if it had anything to do with economics or the city budget or any, Thing really controversial, they would not vote for it. And one time, and then I realized if I don't, how am I going to deal with this? I can't just sit there and do nothing because they've all told me they're not going to vote for it. So one time I made a motion anyway, and I can't really remember the issue. But one of the moderate council members got very angry and said, I told you I wouldn't vote for this. You're just grandstanding. So I had to learn that lesson. And the lesson I learned was don't go there. Work on your issues, get your constituents lined up, and just make the motion. If it gets a second from somebody, um, explain why it matters and see if you can get the votes. Now that worked actually really well because it turned out once something was on the table, people didn't want to vote against it. <laughs> Um, so they would vote for it. And we got lots of community health clinics funded, all kinds of really important things simply by getting the motions on the table. And, um, you know, one, just to show how people could cross lines, Wilmot Sweeney, who was on the council, who later was a wonderful judge in the juvenile courts, but I was making a motion to allow vendors on Telegraph Avenue uh, with lotteries, you know, to say that they had a slot and they had to give the slots up to other vendors later. And the reason we did that was because the Berkeley police had been, had been arresting and um, dispersing the vendors. They were considered potential creators of civil unrest or something. So I made the motion and I'm talking away on the motion and Wilmot Sweeney leans over and says, make a motion. I thought he just wanted to do that so it would be voted down. <laughs> so I didn't pay any attention. I kept on talking. He said again, make a motion. So I thought, okay, I made a motion. Wilmot Sweeney seconded it, it and lo and behold, we had the votes and it passed. <laughs> so, you know, I felt like those were learning times for me. How do you function um, in a situation, in a, what was at the time a pretty adversarial situation on all sides, on all mm -hmm. sides. But we had a great working group of people. Ken Mead, who was the assemblyman at the time, gave us his district office essentially on uh, Telegraph Avenue. We 
staff did, at the time, council members did not have an office. They did not have any staff. Um, we staffed my office with volunteers. This was, everybody was so excited. They finally elected somebody. And we used to have packet meetings um, every, uh, when the, the council agenda came out, my staff would inform community groups working on that issue, whether it was a zoning issue or whatever, um, about it. And then we'd have an open meeting at one of the libraries and people could come and say what they thought. And it was actually, it was a very interesting time. A very open government, lots of con you know controversy. I didn't feel like I had to agree with them all the time, but it was a great way to get people involved. So those were very good years. And then Warren Widener had been elected mayor. <laughs> After about six months of this or a year, he said, you know what? I'm gonna, we're gonna move to New City Hall when we got the farm credit building and every council member is gonna have some paid staff because having staff makes such a difference for an elected person because there are so many issues, all interesting, all complicated. Um, mm -hmm. So. Maybe we can talk about the initiatives because that was a big feature of politics in the in the first half of the 70s. I mean, if you look at the number of initiatives that passed, um, there was just to name them, and then maybe you can talk about your memories of them. So there was a rent control initiative that passed in 72, um, police review commission. In 73, uh, Neighborhood Preservation Ordinance, 74, Limits on Local Campaign Spending, 74, and Fair Representation Ordinance, 75. So we're, yeah. Those are all really, really different things. <laughs> and <laughs> many of them came from very different parts of the community. I mean, the people who wanted rent control or community control of police would have been from the more left parts of the progressive coalition, the neighborhood preservation ordinance was really fueled by neighborhood groups. And I can, I mean, I had been a member of the Lacan Neighborhood Association before I was elected. And I, re, you know, our neighborhood was all zoned for small apartment buildings. We may be going back there, who knows, but we were. And I remember a BART a, a official coming to meet with our neighborhood association People were very concerned about ticky tack apartment buildings wall to wall. And he said, you people can't keep Berkeley an overgrown small town forever. And at that time, everybody looked at each other and said, you wanna make a bet. And we did. And the neighborhood preservation, which is an ordinance passed, I supported it at the time. Um, and I think really, I'm very glad that we're not wall to wall, flimsy, two story, soft story apartment buildings. Um, this is where I and almost everybody that I know has evolved over time. We didn't know about global warming then. We didn't really think about clean air. This is a long time ago, you know? And now we know, the challenge really is how to keep our beautiful local architecture and our really livable community walkable streets, but also have more people living close to work and transit, which is one of the reasons I really love the ADU ordinances, the things that will allow us um, to preserve our streetscapes but to find ways to fit more people in to many of our neighborhoods. Yeah. And what were some of the other ones you mentioned? Like, you know, so um, the, well, rent control, that was a big issue in the seventies, huh? A big issue. Um, it was a big issue and it seemed to be needed because if you kept down building 
So you didn't have, and the university kept growing and prices kept going up and the black community was gentrifying as the old families who had lived here were, were pushed out or I think a lot of what happened was elders died and the children could get all this money for the house and they could go buy a better house for themselves in another community. So you had the gentrification of South Berkeley. So in order to not displace people, it became important to do rent control um, and how it was implemented you know, rent control is probably one of the things that gets you right into local businesses and local people fighting. <laughs> because the real estate industry, which has opposed rent control and almost everything else that is that that messes in their business, right? That they're certainly very, very powerful in Sacramento, the Apartment Owners Association, the Building Industry Association. They make campaign contributions. And um, so it was very, very controversial. And um, it's interesting to me now that after having been banned by the state legislature, it is now coming back all across the state from very mainstream people, uh, some form of rent control. What you want is something that isn't punitive, that, take, that takes into account small landlords, I think, but also that doesn't just allow price gouging because it's, because it's possible. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. So I'm curious, the, the fact that there were so many initiatives um, in a space of very few years, were these issues, some of them at least, that were taken up or were tried to be introduced to the city council and the city council did not address them and so then they became initiatives? Um, well, two of them for what for which that's the case. Because when Ying, Ying Kelly was elected to the city council, I had somebody I could actually um, talk with and strategize with for the very first time. But we um, began to raise the issue of divesting from South Africa because there was a lot of communities concern about that time about apartheid and what it was doing in South Africa and never, never get the votes. Finally, it got to be an initiative and ha ha, passed, right? Another example of that very local was the proposal for an industrial park in West Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And that was very much championed by the moderate council members and very much opposed by us. It would have torn down and displaced even more of the community than ultimately Fourth Street did. But um, it, and the whole notion of an industrial park and what would happen anyway, we, and we got a lot of uh, support then from things like Baja, <laughs> uh, the, architectural heritage people um, because they didn't want to tear down those cute little old houses down in West Berkeley. And finally, we did an initiative on that one and it passed. And then later, 4th Street was developed, which is now one of the city's biggest tax paying operations. <laughs> um, it used to be 4th Street and BMW. BMW uh, dealership and a lot of affordable housing went in and um, first time homeowners program, but it took an initiative to do that. We didn't have a majority on the council. Mm. So when, when was that passed to allow the fourth street development? Well, it didn't allow it. It was simple. In fact, 
you guys should go back. I can't remember what the initiative actually said, but it ended the industrial park idea, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. um, I am going to say that it was in the latter part of the 1970s. You see, what ha one of the things um, that happened was in 1977, um, I was asked to serve in the Carter administration. And at the time, I was the regional director of what has become the Corporation for National Service that was called Action at the time. And at the time, they let me stay on the city council, but they said, you can't run for re-election. So I'd been elected, re-elected in 75. And in 79, I did not run. Um, but during that time, I did have a pretty important day job and I had to travel a bunch and Anna Rabkin was my one paid aide and, uh, she, you know, worked on these issues a lot and she later became city auditor and she was a great city auditor as well. Um, but anyway, I can't, I cannot remember the exact wording of the initiative. Yeah, no, sure. It wasn't, I, I was taking this list from a book and um, the, 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 anyhow, neither the West Berkeley Industrial Project um, came up as an initiative nor Forest Street. So it's different, different must have been not right at this period. about something else I read about you, that you were intent upon getting the details of the budget before it went before the city council for what seemed like maybe rubber stamp approval. What were your concerns? Okay. Um, so just think about this. Um, this was one of the real uh, formative and difficult experiences that I had very early on as a young council member, right? The first city budget. It turned out they didn't give council members the budget. They gave them a sort of five page memo saying, this is what we're going to do. And since we were interested in really knowing what we were going to do, and that was the time where the free clinic was one of the few um, places you could go if you didn't have money for a hospital. You know, there were so many community needs that um, I had to make a motion for a line item budget. And the city manager at the time was furious. And many of the council members, um, why did we want that? One council member said to me, you don't get it. Um, we're like a board of directors, you just go and do what the, mm. what the president of the organization, the city manager suggests. And I thought, well, no, that's not why I was elected. Um, and that was a case where that first year, my office did a whole alternative budget. And then the army and Ira did an alternative budget to a third other budget and the city manager did not fund many of the things we asked for and what I found at that time was I got the mic and I just started making motions we're going to give this much money to this clinic we're going to give this much money to this arts group we're going to do the, you know, street trees, whatever it was. And what I found was once you got that motion on the floor, the council passed it. And we made huge changes to the, to the city budget um, simply by knowing what was in it and being able to make motions and augment certain funds. Now, I, you know, we all know budget is it's a statement of values. A budget is everything. <laughs> um, you know, what I now think about government is the budget is the most important thing. And the second most important thing is implementation and 
follow-up hearings because you can pass a lot of motions and nothing will happen unless. And another thing I learned also from my experience working for the federal government at the time was how important it is to have good relationships with staff um, because they can basically decide whether you succeed or fail and or finding the staff members who agree with you and want to help you. And if they suggest that something isn't going to work, you can take it seriously. It might not. And you have to rethink how to get there. So, you know, it, I, it was a huge learning time. But yes, that was a hotly contested discussion about uh, the budget process and getting a line item budget. Mm -hmm. So sticking with financial uh, uh, aspects, um, I read that you proposed an economic development commission for Berkeley. Can you tell us a little bit about that and where that went? I can't uh -huh. remember it. <laughs> <laughs> tell you the truth, I sounds perfectly plausible. Okay, okay. Oh. Well, I read this is from, a, 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 I guess, a book a chapter in a book called The Progressive City, the book is called, and it's a chapter on Berkeley. Um, it said that you proposed an economic development commission. I think you're, the city council uh, that you were, while you were on it, did not take it up. Um, but then when Gus Newport became mayor in 79, he did. Um, uh -huh. But anyhow, you were gone by then. So maybe that's why you, uh, was gone by then. I was out of local government for five years or six years. Yeah, yeah. All right, so about um, ecology. So you spearheaded a UC Berkeley study that showed the potential damage to marine life in the Berkeley Marina if the waterfront were developed. And can you tell us a little bit about what developments were being proposed? Yeah. That was huge. And if you ever need more on this, the East Bay Regional Park District did an oral history um, of me about this and maybe some other people because they uh, commissioned an oral uh, history of the East Bay Regional Park District. So there's a lot of details there, but um, yeah, the at the time, uh, a real estate firm, a big real estate firm, Catellus, uh, had proposed a shopping center down on the, mar the marina landfill. And that would have been a big tax incentive for the city because sales tax was a form of local revenue. Um, but that was a relatively easy issue. I mean, the council really came around and was quite united. That's my recollection, because we were able to defeat that. And then Catellus brought a lawsuit. And then there were people saying, well, there's a lawsuit we have to give in. And others mm -hmm. saying, no, we're going to gut it out to the end. And then this lasted till 1986, because when I was running for mayor, there uh, were competing initiatives, one which would have allowed much more development because Catellus would sue us, um, and one which did not. It was very carefully written. It was championed by the Sierra Club. Um, and it's the one I supported. And that one passed. And that allowed, you know, a couple of hotels, a couple of restaurants, but basically kept the rest of the um, the rest of the area open, open space. That lawsuit went all the way to the US Supreme Court. Mm. And mayor, during that time, we got to celebrate with the Supreme Court with Lawrence Tribe representing the city of Berkeley, won. And we were, and our zoning stood, and that's why we have our beautiful waterfront. 
It went to the U.S. Supreme Court or the California Supreme Court? The U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> That's interesting. So what was the constitutional issue at stake? I can't. I'm not a lawyer, I don't know, but I remember we were so thrilled when Lawrence Tribe agreed to take our case. It was whether the zoning was a taking or not. It was a zoning issue, a land use issue. Were there other things in the area of ecology that you worked on? Um, recycling, Does, did that start in that time? We got the it is one of, if not the first recycling programs in the country. And it was controversial. And we really depended on a few wonderful entrepreneurs who figured out they could clean out glass bottles and reuse the glass and, and do things. And the Ecology Center got started along that time. And I, I hope they do an oral history because I can still remember this nice little, this very quiet hippie couple coming into my office and saying, we're gonna start an ecology center because it's really important. Mm. We sort of encouraged them and helped them. And they, they built what now is a really important, wonderful institution, both for this community, the region, and it's really a model for the whole country. Um, they do fantastic work. Yeah. So, um, now, Was that when you were a mayor already, when that no, happened? No. I was on city council when his name was Cliff, <laughs> and I forget her name, uh -huh. but when these you know, people started things then. That was another thing. It was incredible. Like one thing that happened was a woman I barely knew called me one day and said, um, my daughter was raped at Berkeley High School. Would you come talk to her? And I thought, what can I do? But okay, yeah, I went and talked to her. And the young woman said that her treatment by the police had been one of the worst aspects of this because she felt humiliated and exposed and not treated very respectfully. And at the time, and she said, if she could keep this from happening to other women or young girls, she would feel better, it would make her easier to heal. So I happened to know a young woman or a, a woman, she was either an adjacent professor or a, a graduate student who was working on feminist issues. It was the beginning of the women's movement named Julia Schwendiger. So I called Julia and said, could you get together and figure out if there's anything you can do? So she got together with this family and they came back six months later with a proposal for Bay Area Women Against Rape, which, you know, again, grew into such an important institution. And I can remember when they moved from counseling victims and going to the hospital with people to training the police. I mean, it, you know, they're, they kept burgeoning, but they were a wonderful group. And then later, the same people kind of formed the Berkeley Women's Center, which went on for a number of years and, and became a women's shelter. You know, just so many things grew out of that. Mm -hmm. and, but it happened a lot. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about it, you know, it was the, some of it was the days of, uh, what was the money? Nixon did it and people, didn't like it, but it turned out to fund a lot, a lot of creativity. I'm missing it right now, but where communities got a block grant instead of gen, you know, program money, and we always thought we would lose out on that, but it it um, ended up funding a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, 
maybe you could talk a little bit more about some of the other feminist proposals you had. You mentioned earlier childcare. Um, was it something that you had I also in mind about um, flex time work for women? Oh. Um, yeah, I totally believe in that, by the way. Um, I wanted to do flex time for city employees where we would pro, if they wanted to work half time, we would pro prorate their credits because really at that time too, it was very difficult for young women with children to enter the workforce. Um, it, there wasn't a culture that supported it. There wasn't, um, we didn't have, any, well, we still, it's still a crisis, isn't it? So um, I proposed that the city um, fund some childcare. The city attorney at the time said it would be illegal. It wasn't a, a, man, a mandated or allowed city purpose. And I, I remember saying to the city attorney, if, they, if somebody wants to sue us, let them sue us. Let's see, let's not do it because you think it might not be legal. And of course, nobody ever sued us. And during the time I was in office and the time I was in Sacramento, we worked and worked and worked to make, get more subsidized childcare uh, slots to get some of the childcare organizations like Bananas going in the community. That was started by a couple of women I met in the SHARE campaign. <laughs> when they had young kids, wanted to go back to work, didn't know, had no way of trying to figure out what kind of, how to make childcare arrangements. Um, so they started Bananas. And, but, you know, it's a wonderful organization of vetting childcare providers, giving vouchers now that we have vouchers for subsidized child care training child care workers getting programs in our community colleges so they could improve their skills um, again if in fact um, they were a wonderful group of, of uh, mothers that were going to make it happen and i'm just laughing now to think about um, yeah, how long, how those women really did come out of this local government movement to have control of your future. You were the first woman to be elected mayor of Berkeley in 1986. Is that right? I was. Yeah. And did it feel historic? when you won the election? I, no. <laughs> um, you know, it felt, um, it felt like really being given your working papers, so to speak, you know, that, because the years right before me were tumultuous too. You may remember that um, Berkeley Citizens Action, which was the name of the organization at the time had really swept and they had a very clear majority. The, at that time, the last money for public housing was coming from the federal government and it was sort of use it or lose it. And the city council did it. They wanted to do scattered site public housing. So they that's what they did. Well, it turned out Berkeley at the time, right, 1980, uh, was still very much neighborhood preservation ordinance. Don't build anything. We don't want anything. And every single neighborhood came out and said, don't you put it in our neighborhood. And the city council said, we need, a, we need subsidized affordable housing. And they did it. And the result of that was district elections. Uh, because the neighborhood organizations who had worked very hard on the neighborhood preservation ordinance um, basically swung into action with the Berkeley Democratic Club at the time. 
this is a way to get rid of these BCA people. And they uh, put in district elections and drew the first district lines in a way to try to ensure that um, there would be that they would favor them. It was gerrymandering, but they wrote the initiative and the initiative went on the ballot and it happened. Now, you know, I think myself, I, there are many people who disagree with me, but I, um, I think district elections has been good in many ways. And, it, you know, it may have some problems, but whatever. Whatever, everybody lives with it now. So how did the change from um, citywide to district elections affect the city council that you took over the helm of in 1986? Well, in the mayor was the only, as the mayor is now, the only person elected citywide. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I believe that every council member ran every two years or something. I think that got changed when it, all it did is would keep an election happening all the time. Yeah. But yours is too little. And they went to staggered four year terms, which was much better. Um, but yeah, I was really trying to figure out how to end the culture wars. <laughs> but I was a, a progressive. And um, I think I did pretty well. There were some council members who were entrenched and I think wanted to see me fail, but there were most of the members I could work with. And we did work together and um, I appreciated them. We, at that point, we were not in good times like we had been in when I was on the council. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in bad times. Uh, budget deficits, trying to figure out uh, how to keep basic services going. And I was always really proud that we managed to pass a balanced budget without cutting services to the to the point where you shouldn't really even pretend to have them anymore. Um, but that was a balancing act that was totally different. <laughs> and um, I, I really appreciated the work that uh, people like Fred Collins Not a while, and, and um, Nancy Skinner was on the council. She's a state. Carol Davis was on the council. Um, I think no, maybe she was not on anymore. She was a council member. She and Bill Rumford, who I worked with. But anyway, it was. Um, it, it was a very interesting time. Mm -hmm. so, so briefly, what were your priorities when you entered? Do you remember what your hopes were? Hmm. You know, I, I'm feeling that they were quite general. I wanted to keep providing the basic city services in a high quality way. I wanted us to do whatever we could <clears throat> to create economic equity and economic justice and racial justice and equity for women and see the city, you know, move forward in a progressive direction. And when you're the executive, it's a different role than being a legislator. <laughs> um, when you're a legislator, you vote on your proposals and other people's. You, the wonderful aspect of it is 
you have an idea, you can put the idea on the table and everybody has to talk about it and deal with it and vote on it eventually. Um, if you're the mayor, one of the things is to try to pull everybody together. And in a council that had started out bitterly divided in, you know, the Hatfields and the McCoys, BCA versus the Democratic Club, it was trying to find the issues we could work on together, moving them forward, um, listening to other people, finding ways to make their ideas work for them. It's quite a different role, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Can you remember some controversies, difficult things that you hadn't expected to deal with that you had to? Well, it was a lot of the difficulty. Um, a lot of the difficulty was around the budget, the fact that money, oh, well, Pop 13 had passed. That's what happened. We were pre right. 13 when I was uh, on the call. Right. That was 78, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, we're post Prop 13. There's no money for anything. Um, the state was, I mean, it was, it was really a mess trying to come out of that with our morale intact, our services intact, and, um, you know, work through some of the political difficulties to get there. So a lot of it was economic development mm -hmm. and how we could become a little more self-sufficient as a city. Mm -hmm. um, keep our money circulating within the city. And I'm trying to think of some. some you, how did you raise money? What? I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say there was also a lot of Berkeley sister cities at the time. And but, but those are really, they were the frosting on the cake because citizen groups ran every single one of those mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were all very established like Sakai or very ephemeral <laughs> like some of the other ones but um it was interesting because Berkeley people have always have always thought globally acted locally mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sorry I interrupted I was just wondering how the city of Berkeley made up the shortfall after Prop 13 did they pass bond measures to make that up? Or did they assess extra taxes themselves to pay for libraries, schools, for example? Well, Berkeley, one thing about, oh, I'm getting an echo. Okay, if you're not, I'll keep talking. But Berkeley people are very generous with their tax money. And, you know, I can't, there's been a lot of water under the dam since I was mayor, right? So, but I know that we passed bond issues for the libraries, bond issues for the schools. Berkeley people do that bond issues for affordable housing. Um, it, it's been amazing. And with every, with every step forward like that, we worry that we're pushing people too far. But then the fact is that everybody wants to come live here because we have such, such a wonderful community. Honestly, when I, I, I had so many fellow legislators when I was in Sacramento that would say, oh, I just love Berkeley. <laughs> you know, your culture, your bookstores, your, mm -hmm. um, nobody ever mentioned our potholes, but. <laughs> really and and that's why our real estate prices this is a real worry are becoming um so difficult right now because we are a wonderful place to live and more people want to live here than can mm -hmm. and how do we try to maintain our diversity at one time people opposed to rent control used to say oh rent control. 
It's just those voluntarily poor people, like those artists and musicians <laughs> and whatever. And I would think, yeah, but we like them. That's part of who we are here. Um, they aren't going to be able to stay here. You know, Mil Mildred Howard is a case in point, a nationally recognized artist whose mother was very active in the politics of the 60s and 70s and just a great leader. She was responsible for undergrounding Bart wall to wall in Berkeley, um, but couldn't afford the rent couldn't afford to keep the family home, et cetera. So um, it's an issue because I hope we keep our cutting edge imagination in this community. But we seem to be 